have your attention, please? So I assume everybody just had a tour and was impressed with what was uh, there, and I'm going to thank everybody. So um, that was the result of a lot of work. Deborah oversaw it. It was came about in part out of a strategic planning committee. Um, John Goldman and and uh, Janet Hill chaired the committee at that time. I think you all know John, Janet passed away about a month or so ago. And um, uh, the, the idea was to really do more to tell people about the story of John Kenny because, as some of you have heard me say, it turns out that of the 330 million Americans, uh, more than 200 million of them were not alive when John Kenny was president. So many people just don't know about him, and now we, we're, we're trying to get people to know a little bit more about him. Clearly, the, the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston does a spectacular job, but you know we're not the Kennedy Library. We, we have other purposes, and so we wanted to have this in addition to all the other things that we, we have here. And I think it was extremely well done. And Deborah, thank you for overseeing it, and everybody else who was involved with it. And Ellery, was Ellery here? Where's Ellery? Ellery, Ellery did a great job, worked around the clock. Um, I, I, I actually, he gave me a tour a week before, and there was nothing there. I mean, there was nothing, nothing. I mean, not one thing. And I, I said, are you sure it's going to be ready in a week? But people worked around the clock. So we had an, uh, Deborah had assembled an academic advisory committee to provide um, historical expertise about President Kennedy and, and the ex exhibition and so forth. And two of the members are here. We had one member at the uh, pre-opening, I guess about a week ago, a presser from the Kennedy School. And now we have uh, uh, Scott is here, and Scott Sandage is the professor at the Carnegie Mellon uh, University in uh, Pittsburgh, and um, Peggy Bionashian is a professor at the University of Virginia, and uh, they were members of the Academic Advisory Committee, have different areas of expertise, but uh, before we go through what you did here, tell us about your area of expertise, uh, Scott. Uh, thank you so much for having us here and, and for asking that question. Uh, I'm a, a cultural historian at Carnegie Mellon University. I um, write books about um, identity and culture in America. And one of my areas of expertise is monuments and memorials and the way that people use them. So for example, I wrote a study of the Lincoln Memorial and the way that its meaning in American life was redefined by the civil rights movement and others who have held events in that space to add meaning to something that was designed in another way. Okay, and Peggy, your area of expertise is? Um, I work broadly on the intersection of culture, American culture and politics, and um, one of the books that I did that's most related to this exhibit is a book on jazz musicians who toured for the State Department during the Cold War. And some of the most exciting dynamic tours were during the Kennedy administration. And uh, it was just a joy to work on this exhibit and learn more of, uh, more of the different dimensions of Kennedy's cultural interest and the people who surrounded him. And as we talk, um, and I, I'm delighted to, you know, the tours are represented in the exhibit but I'm also so excited about the way they intersect with many other facets of culture at the Kennedy White House. Okay, so um, the, in, the exhibition has a lot to do with uh, theater and artists who surrounded uh, President Kennedy. Was he surrounded by artists more than other presidents, would you say? Well, um, absolutely. I mean, I, I see a really big change in the Kennedy administration because in Eisenhower and most administrations before that, um, their artists were not at the White House, they were not surrounded by White House, most of the performances were of military bands, and then and Kennedy comes in, and artists of all ilks were there. And um, I also love the fact that they, that popular culture exhibit that sort of shows um, sort of both you know the high and the low and culture of all sorts. But one of the things that most fascinated me was learning, and I, I see now Kennedy as somebody who surrounded himself with cultural mediators at the inaugural, the gala, the night, not the inaugural ball that night, but the night before. The people who attended included. Harry Belafonte, Ella Fitzgerald sang, they both performed, Frank Sinatra performed, not surprising, Peter, Paul, and Mary folk. So this is a very dynamic intersection of what's happening in American culture, and it also indicates, I mean, we know that 
um, Kennedy, like other presidents, was slow on civil, on civil rights policy and eventually made a really important statement. And, so, and we know that you know, um, James Baldwin approached Robert Kennedy. So we know some of those stories, and it, it, it's very important that the legislation changed, and it's an important story of slowness. But if you look on the cultural end, um, Harry Belafonte really promoting civil rights has been there for years. So it, it, it shifts the story because you get a sense of Ken a more dynamic cultural world and Kennedy being influenced by that cultural world. And, the, I, and I also just want to add that there's fantastic footage, and I don't know how much is linked out there because I didn't have that much time to look, but the footage of the event that raised money to eventually make this center has a fantastic uh, array of musicians. And at that event in 62, Belafonte sang um, Summer Song, um, and then he also sang a version of Michael Rowe, Your Boat Ashore, an African-American spiritual with a very sharp verses about the civil rights movement, about al naming Alabama and Mississippi, holding out, you know, a, holding, you know, defending segregation. So you get, so, and you know, this is not, again, it's, it's another dimension of the story and that's so important of, in, in terms of the way um, these, this cultural world is moving with the political world and maybe in some sense leading and pushing okay. it. All right, Scott, uh, now you've had it, did you tour it uh, before today or you've seen it? No, I I toured it with you, with you folks, just before okay, lunch. Okay, so well, as a result of all of your work, and now you saw the the, the results. What did you think? I thought it was amazing. Um, we were more content con consultants. Uh, we talked about the messages and maybe some of the images. We daydreamed a little bit about possible artifacts. Uh, I really wanted the cello that Yo-Yo Ma played as a seven-year-old boy in 1962 at the concert that Penny just mentioned. But um, the, the biggest question that we were presented with was how to make it clear to visitors that this building that we're standing in is the memorial to John F. Kennedy in, the, in Washington. Um, your nearest neighbor is, of course, the memorial to Abraham Lincoln and the two buildings uh, by Henry Bacon and um, Edward Durrell Stone are very similar uh, in <clears throat> being long, horizontal, Parth Parthenon-like temples to democracy. And the problem that Stephen Kieran uh, presented to us all was how do you make an exhibition that doesn't have artifacts? Um, so most not, of not Kennedy, many, not many artifacts. Not many artifacts, um, and most of Kennedy's personal items and and items of a historic nature, for example, the um, podiums, the, the two lecterns at which Nixon and Kennedy stood in 1960 for the famous televised debates. Those are at the Smithsonian, so they're not available uh, for this. But what became clear is that the artifact that this exhibition contextualizes and helps visitors understand is the artifact that we're in right now. This building is the artifact. This building is the memorial to John F. Kennedy. And although it's a living memorial, well, so is the Lincoln Memorial, a living memorial, a place where its meanings uh, derive from the people who come there and, and Marian Anderson singing in 1939 or uh, the various speakers at the March on Washington in 1963. The Kennedy Center is that same kind of platform for free and creative expression. And I think if you walk through this exhibit, it's clear, or I hope it will be clear for the first time, why didn't they build a statue to him? Why didn't they build uh, something like the, the Jefferson Memorial or the Lincoln Memorial? Why did they build a, an art center? And that's the, the artifact that's being interpreted, is the building itself. The artifacts that are there, um, some were lent by the Kennedy Library, but some were purchased on eBay. And I talked to the museum, uh, the, the consultant, and uh, he was spending a lot of COVID period of time surveying eBay and looking what was available, and he bought a lot of the stuff on eBay. So uh, you never know what you're going to find on eBay, I guess. Uh, so uh, President Kennedy had a concert at the White House at which Pablo Casals famously played. 
Now, that was in 1962, I think it was. Why is that still so remembered by people, uh, Peggy? I mean, it was one concert. There are concerts all the time in the White House. What was it about either that concert or the fact that President Kennedy invited Pablo Casals that people still remember it? Um, well, I, I think on the one hand, there weren't always concerts at the White House, so this was a really big deal, and you know, Jackie made, had a huge impact on you know on the on pushing bringing these artists in. So this is a really big shift. And what's so significant about it is that Cassell's up to this point, it's a fact that he came to the United States because um, prior to this he was not going to the United States because of the long support of the Franco dictatorship in Spain, but his his um, he, he, we, Kennedy gave him great hope. So it's the very fact of the Kennedy presidency and Kennedy's internationalism and the way Kennedy was open to the world and reaching out to the world that, um, that shifted his position that, that the United States was now worthy of being visited and now he would come to the White House. So that's, that, that and, is a big shift. And Kennedy held a uh, dinner at the White House that's also very famous where he invited all the living U.S. Nobel Prize winners um, that's not been done since then, is that right? Anybody, you know, Peggy? Not to my knowledge. I, I, I don't think that it, has, it, it has that, I don't think that has been done. And, um, and again, that's very, very much a part of, of, of Kennedy's sense of greatly respecting um, science, art, literature, and his love of literature and poetry, but sort of embracing all realms of the sciences. And, and this, again, is a moment where um, still with the sort of a pall of McCarthyism and suspicion of artists and scientists right. still hanging over the country to openly embrace, um, embrace that thinking and, and um, commit a country to excellence in sciences in all areas of inquiry and in the arts is a, okay. is a very, very strong theme of, of the Kennedy White House. Yeah, there hasn't been such a dinner since then because it's more complicated to do it now. At that time, there were roughly 58 or 59 living uh, Nobel Prize winners were American. Now they're roughly 200. So to do such a dinner, and I tried to get one done once under President Obama, it, you'd have to build a, do a tent on the outside because that's too complicated, and it was just not worth doing, I guess they felt. Anyway, so um, uh, Scott, so uh, tell us a bit, little bit more, give us some knowledge of history. The Lincoln Memorial, uh, why did it take so long to build that one? He died in, in 1865, and that memorial didn't open until 1922. Two. So that seems like a long time to wait to build a memorial. W what was the problem there? Well, there were some hard feelings about um, <clears throat> um, the war that ended in 1865, and um, truly uh, one of the, the explanations is that people were more skeptical about historical figures than, than we might be now, and it, that sounds counterintuitive, but uh, George Washington's monument wasn't finished until um, almost half a century, more than half a century after his death. Um, so there wasn't a rush to build a memorial to each president or each war uh, in the immediate aftermath. There wasn't as much of a land rush uh, as there is now uh, for the last few spots that are available uh, in downtown Washington on the mall. Um, the Macmillan plan of 1901, which <clears throat> is the reason that we have a national mall with the axis of the Capitol on one end, the Lincoln Memorial on another end, in the middle of the Washington Monument, the White House on <clears throat> one end and the Jefferson Memorial. That was part of a master plan for right. monumental architecture in Washington. Um, and so around 1910, 1909 was the, bice oh, the centennial rather of Abraham Lincoln's birth and so that was the occasion. Uh, it also happened to coincide with the founding of the NAACP which was uh, founded on Lincoln's birthday in 1909. And so those two events, the centennial yeah. and the founding of the NAACP, led to an increased interest as the 50th anniversary of the Civil War was coming up to do something for Lincoln. Well, so the Great Liberator, they have a memorial to the Great Liberator, but were African Americans allowed to sit there and watch it at the opening ceremony? 
Um, so the memorial, the Lincoln Memorial was designed to say as little as possible about enslavement and emancipation. So if you walk in, it says in this temple as in the hearts of the American people for whom he saved the Union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined forever. They specifically wrote that to emphasize the saving of the Union and it doesn't say anything about emancipation or the great emancipator. Um, <clears throat> so the idea that um, the dedication should uh, include distinguished men of color like Robert Russo Moton, who was the, the successor to um, Booker T. Washington at the Tuskegee Institute. He was the keynote speaker. And a lot of people uh, and a lot of books do say that he was not permitted to sit with the other um, dignitaries at the 1922 dedication. That's actually not true. He was uh, seated among the dignitaries. He was seated next to the poet Edwin Markham. What is true is that <clears throat> black Washingtonians, um, lawyers, doctors, um, ordinary people who wanted to come and see the dedication which was open to the public, those uninvited um, uh, people of color were put in a segregated seating section, <clears throat> which was across the road and away from the main, um, the main crowd. Okay. So, so um, the de Kooning um, of, of uh, Peggy, you're familiar with the de Kooning painting of John Kennedy? That was, the, we talked about it there? Yeah. yeah. So um, why did he decide to let her paint him? Was she that famous then? You know, um, somebody else mic. is going to have to you're, help you're, me out. Oh, oh, yeah, somebody else is going to have to help me out on this, and I bet um, either Scott or Deborah or somebody in the audience, or I bet you could help us out with this. <laughs> because to um, he actually was asked by a number of people um, who wanted to paint him, and he actually um, agreed to do it. Uh, he didn't want to sit very long, and she. And she spent a lot of time on that painting, and as you saw, and somebody can tell, explain the technology, um, Ellery or somebody, who, the technology we have in, in the uh, exhibition where you get your painting by de Kooning, how does that work? So um, the exhibit is designed by Green Isle, but it includes a video uh, programmer that takes the image and then takes the photographic image right. and marries the photographic image with the painterly But theoretically, you could program it so that you could have your painting, your portrait done by Leonardo or by Picasso, whoever the artist you want to be. You have to get the royalties payment and all that done. But, <laughs> but, but uh, you could have your, your face done by anybody, right? That's correct. So part of the magic in this is actually the programming that takes the style and your image, melds them together, and comes up with the portrait. And so it's, we think it'll be so popular, we're going to have another one of them? Okay. So it's and let me just add. I mean, I so I could not speak to the story of how you know of how the artist was chosen initially, but the the fact that it's the fact that it's an abstract style, I think, really speaks to the dynamism and what the culture of that moment right. like, and the way that um, both you know JFK and Jackie embrace that. I um, we see from the exhibit um, we see from in the exhibit that Mark Rothko was one of the early visitors to the White House. I mean, this was a tragically sh short presidency. And, um, and I do think that feature is absolutely fantastic. And I, I was able to come early in the morning and, and have, you know, do my portrait through using the, it's just incredibly clever and it's going to be a great hit. So you probably saw the last week, the, uh, last week the Obama uh, photos or portraits were on rail at the White House. And the uh, woman that painted uh, Michelle Obama was actually trained by and was a protege of Aaron Schickler, who actually had painted the Kennedy portraits in the White House. And you may remember some the Kennedy uh, portrait of the portrait of Kennedy by Aaron Schickler was very controversial at the time because people were used to standard portraits where you're looking, you know, right into the, the painter's eyes, but here he was looking down, his arms folded. It was actually thought to be um, really unusual and maybe not so appropriate at the time. Now it's become a classic. And um, anyway, the portraits last week that were unveiled are uh, complicated. I can go through it later, but anyway. 
Um, so uh, uh, to tell us today your impression of going through this, uh, you've been through many museums, uh, exhibitions like this. What do you think the reaction of people will be to this? Um, I, I think that the portrait maker that we've just been talking about is emblematic of the whole um, experience. It's going to be fun. You know, it, it's bright. Um, the, the way that the 360 degree freeze around the, the top is constantly changing. It's directing you, oh, I should go over to this other part. There are the uh, break-ins for JFK's speeches. And the whole space is so open that I think people will be able to move very freely. Um, but it's a colorful, dynamic, interactive, fun exhibit. And um, fun is not to be underrated when um, presenting history to um, the average visitor. I loved also the, I love the table um, where you can touch the different plates and see, you know, follow the different dinners at the White House. And it was, you know, absolutely delightful. And some of them cross over. So, um, I, and I didn't have enough time to trace all of that, but um, Balanchine was there. And I, this is a, another wonderful story because New York City Ballet went, to, was, was in Moscow and at the Soviet Union in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I, I, I just as an historian, I have to just di divert for a moment and say, because it's such an important, um, it, it, it's so important that Kennedy spoke on many occasions, including at the, um, the, the wonderful concert to raise money for the place we are now gathering, that um, about the importance, the, the, the importance of, of America's deep ties to Russian people through the poetry, through the literature, through the arts, and that, that, uh, that Americans had more in common with Soviet people than they had differences. So that's a whole element. And, and, but, but the Balanchine is somebody who, is, who was from St. Petersburg and the Soviet Union, and then so important in New York City of LA, and those kind of artistic exchanges are just so profound and important. And again, I love the fact that um, Kennedy embraced that. And those plates are so incredibly cool, but apparently one of them was broken by a child yesterday when a, a, a school group must have come through. So um, we're gonna have to be careful with how fun this is. So uh, President Kennedy um, enjoyed the arts and so forth, but. He wasn't really a, a classical music person as opposed to a, a uh, Broadway person, would you say, Peggy? Um, I, mean, that, I, mean, that, th I mean, that's I think people's general understanding and they're apparently, um, Jackie used to joke, they said, what's Kennedy's favorite song? And she'd say, you know, hail to the chief. But, but I actually, I, I think, and I, I do think there is an element of, of him as far as, as I've come to understand embracing you know, Broadway musicals along with other things. But what I want to say is that that's a broad, you know, the Broadway theater was, I mean, it was pretty creative and spectacular in many, many ways. And it also had deep links to these other forms. And so my biggest surprise and what I, you know, my delightful surprise as I delved into this is that you don't have this well, here's a Broadway musical, and that's popular, and here's the classical music, or here's the jazz, that you've got these, um, these forms circulating and influencing each other. And again, this is a profoundly dynamic period where um, the, our, the jazz musicians, I mean, um, J Jackie brought the first jazz band to the White House. It was first, it was Bossa Nova, and then Dave Brubeck and Tony Bennett came and played together for the um, college interns at the end of their summer. And it was it was supposed to be in the White House, but it was too large, so they moved it. It was like right, you know, a, sort of adjacent. But you've got these forms circulating and influencing one another. And people like Brubeck are on tour for the State Department, but then they bring back rhythmic forms from South Asia and the Middle East, and that starts to influence their music, and this becomes popular American music. So it's the movement and dynamism that I think is, to okay. me, that's the hallmark of what makes this cultural period and, and, and the Kennedy White House, because they embraced that. They brought that right. in. It wasn't kept at arm's length. So where did the, the whole Camelot uh, motif come from? Where, when did people begin to associate uh, the Kennedy administration with, with Camelot. Was that Jackie Kennedy's post-assassination um, interview? Do you know? Well, he was known to like the Broadway, um, the original cast recording of that Broadway show. And uh, uh, one of the items that 
um, we dreamt about was acquiring JFK's White House Stereo, which has been sold a few times uh, along with his record collection. And Camelot is famously in that record collection. Um, but I think that um, for those of you who have seen the mass um, or are going to see it, um, that is, is very much emblematic of this building in the sense that there are so many cultures and so many cultural forms represented in that piece. Um, it is dance, it is choral, it is classical music, it is modern, um, it is, there is bits of Broadway, um, you know, you can hear a little bit of West Side Story in there and you can hear a little bit of arias and barcarolles in there and um, you can hear gospel in there. And so the, the way that the Kennedys, both of them with their broad and diverse tastes, brought so many cultures and so many cultural forms into the White House is so movingly and, and brilliantly replicated in that piece that it, it was just the perfect piece to, to start with 51 years ago and the perfect piece to end the season with this year. Okay, so um, Peggy, um, if you were gonna uh, talk to your students about why they should visit the, this exhibition, what would you tell them? Why should they make a trip from Charlottesville to see this, if, if at all? I think, well, I would tell them it's um, bright and gorgeous and fun and dynamic and beautiful in the, in the same ways that um, Scott has already lined up, um, like, uh, outlined. And, um, and I, I, I think I would also tell them um, that it, 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 again, I keep coming back to the notion of dynamic and creative, but I think it really captures um, a dynamism about this moment, and and it's it it captures real connections between different forms of culture, between different parts of the world, and a profound connectiveness um, that I think. And I think that's, I don't think that's a sense that um, that a lot of people have um, necessarily remembering. Um, this era, or the Kennedy administration in particular, but I also think it's it's not a sense um, a, a sense of dynamism and connectiveness both between different parts of American culture and with the world is something that is so deeply lacking in our I think our current sensibility, where um, we're really far more observing and reacting in different ways to barriers going up between nations, barriers going up between um, different Americans, barriers going up between this, um, you know, very um, art forms that are cordoned off into this is only, you know, this is only this thing or the other thing. So I think that um, the experience of that um, movement across form and parts of the world in different peoples along with the movement across form is, I think it's profoundly human, it's profoundly creative, and it's, it's really, we need a, a massive dose of that in our, um, our contemporary public and human life. So when I look at those films, um, I often think of two things. One, how young Kennedy was, obviously elected at 43, assassinated at 46, and secondly, how thin everybody was in those days. <laughs> if you take a look at those people, including President Kennedy, they were really thin. Um, I don't know how they did it without all the fat-free food that, that we now have, but, but they managed to stay really, really thin, relatively thin. But anyway, that was my impression. So, um, questions? Anybody have any questions about the exhibition? Anybody? Deborah, can you just Deborah go ahead? That was That's Fred. Yeah. That was very much Fred, um, um, the, the biographer, um, who talked about how important literature was to him and how important reading was to him um, during the portions of his childhood when 
he was somewhat frail um, and chronically ill and kept in bed by an overprotective mother and um, that his way of getting out and running around and seeing the world and, and understanding it was through books. And so that was, I think, entirely Fred. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and, and I would um, just add that, um, so it, it, yeah, so we talked about this a great deal and clearly, you know, literature and poetry were so important to Kennedy, but I also, I love the spread because you, there's Robert Frost, there's um, there's uh, just classic writers, and then you have um, From Russia with Love, because Kennedy was a real fan of Ian Fleming, and uh, particularly like that novel and the movie, so you have this great spread of um, all, a, a whole range of culture, um, again, with a, but a very deep appreciation of, of literature and the arts. And let me tell you all a story about the inauguration speech. Um, um, this is not disparaging of uh, President Kennedy, but um, for the inauguration, um, it was suggested by Stuart Udall, who was going to be his Secretary of Interior, and who did, was an outstanding Secretary, Secretary of Interior, that uh, Robert Frost be speaking at the, uh, the event. And uh, Kennedy was very reluctant to let Robert Frost speak because he said, he's pretty eloquent, and you know I don't want to be following somebody who's going to be so <laughs> eloquent. And so he really was very nervous about it, honestly. And uh, ultimately, uh, Robert Frost was invited. Uh, he composed a poem just for the occasion, as some of you may have seen from the film. Uh, the, the, the light, because it was snow out in the ground that day and the sun was out, the glare was so strong he couldn't read uh, the poem he had written. And so he basically, you know, Lyndon Johnson tried to shield the sun for a bit, and the glare, he couldn't do it. So ultimately, Frost just went ahead and, and just uh, recited from memory another poem he had, which he, knew, he could do from memory. So that he actually, the one that he actually composed, he never actually read it there. President Kennedy's inaugural address, um, which I think was the best of the 20th century, uh, we have a, a, from the library, I think there's an excerpt from the reading text signed by President Kennedy. It was very complicated. Um, it, it's an incredible speech. It's about 1,200 words or so, not very long by normal standards of inaugural addresses. Uh, President Kennedy was uh, considered uh, maybe not a person who was as intellectually gifted to be able to write a speech like that, and there were people who actually uh, thinking that he didn't write his own inaugural address because there were accusations, as some of you may know, that he didn't really write profiles in courage. He was in the hospital uh, at the time, and uh, it was hard to think you could write a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning book, and he was accused of not having written it, and that was ultimately uh, settled and so forth, but he was always conscious that he wasn't seen by people as intellectually heavy enough, even though he was quite smart, to have written a speech like the inaugural address. But he wanted people to think he wrote that address. So how did he get people to, th to actually believe he wrote it? Well, he used a technique that FDR had used. FDR was, you know, not a genius, to be honest. He was a very smart person, but not considered a genius. And he had a man named Raymond Moley, uh, write his speech. He was a professor at Columbia. And so Raymond Moley wrote the famous inaugural address of FDR, uh, not, we have nothing to fear but fear itself and so forth. And, but FDR, considered a little bit intellectually not gifted, wanted people to think he wrote it. So he took Moley's draft and wrote it out in his own handwriting. And so later, uh, it was, he sold it, it was sold for a large sum of money. And so he actually taken the draft and written it out. So here's what Kennedy did. He was coming back from Palm Beach, where he spent most of the inauguration. In those days, there were no transition efforts. The government of the United States now funds elaborate transition efforts. There was no elaborate transition effort in those days. There was no money at all expended for transition offices, transition people. Just on January 20th, you just showed up. And so, there was, so Kennedy had no place to run the transition. He had no office space, nothing. So he basically ran it from his father's place in Palm Beach. And he was coming back from three days before the inauguration, and he had his private plane. There were no government planes for that purpose then, and it was called Caroline. And uh, on the plane was Hugh Seide. Hugh Seide was the time correspondent for the White House, and he knew Kennedy pretty well. And so it wasn't unusual that he'd be flying back with Kennedy. And there, like, there might have been some other journalists on the plane. So Kennedy calls Seide back into the back room where he's sitting there, and he says to Hugh Seide, um, what do you think of this speech? And he shows him a couple handwritten pages of the inaugural address. And Seide's saying, wait a 
the guy's going to get inaugurated in three days, and he's writing drafts of the speech now. It should be done by now. What is he? And he's asking me. I'm a journalist. What am I supposed to do? So he read the draft, and he said, oh, I think it's fine, uh, uh, Senator, and, uh, you know, and that was it. So then Hugh Soddy then, after the speech became a big success, he wrote um, uh, an article in the Time magazine. I know that Kennedy wrote that because I saw the draft in his own handwriting. Well, it was a little bit of a trick. Uh, the speech had already been well prepared. It was largely written by Ted Sorensen, but President Kennedy was involved in it. He went through it in many drafts. But Sorensen was the, the master of that, that speech. And he had given a draft to President, or Senator Kennedy, then about to be President Kennedy. And Kennedy, thinking about the FDR situation, he wrote out a couple pages in his own handwriting, and he showed it to Hugh Sidey, who then said, hey, look, it was in his own handwriting. I knew he wrote it. Um, <laughs> So anyway, there were only a couple pages uh, in Kennedy's handwriting because he only wrote about two pages. Those two pages are in the Kennedy Library. And, uh, you know, that was a trick he tried to use to convince people he wrote the speech. It was a great speech. And unfortunately, in those days, they had the view that if you didn't write your own speech, it really wasn't your speech. And, you know, uh, now you wouldn't expect a president of the United States to sit down and write his own speech. He has speechwriters. And, and, and the Kennedy and Sorensen ultimately came to the view that, and they used to say this publicly, uh, if the person who gives the speech, when he gives it or she gives it, it's their speech, whether they wrote it or not, and because they're the ones that are on the line. And so uh, President Kennedy gave the inaugural address. It's his inauguration uh, addre inaugural address, not whether it's Sorensen's or something else. Anyway, um, so s the, the speech is wonderful and has many memorable lines in it, but many of those were really written by somebody other than President Kennedy. Anyway, more than you wanted to know. Okay. <laughs> so um, why don't we, we're going to adjourn for... We have our meeting beginning at 1.30, so any final comments? No? Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.